Hey kids, it's Charlie Abuso again. We're gonna do some more phases, Chem. We're gonna do classes, class number three, uh, number 37 to number 68. Sounds like a lot, but there's a lot of quick ones. Um, you're gonna have to have your reference table, okay? We're gonna write on it today in this class. So make sure you have it out. Get it open to the first page. That's where we're gonna need it. I'm gonna start out this class with the story. Um, this is a true story. I have two children. My daughter is 23, I think. 23, maybe 24. She's in medical college. My son's a senior at UE, he's 18. He's a big, gigantic kid, bigger than me. But when my daughter was little, I was a stay-home dad. My wife went to work. My brothers used to make fun of me, but that's a lot of silly stuff. I enjoyed staying home. And, uh, you know, I do all kinds of things with my daughter. And one of the things I would do, I have to get out of the house, even in the winter, we used to go to the Oakdale Mall when the Oakdale Mall was kind of bustling and hustling, not like, uh, not like the Amazon world we live in now or the pandemic. But we'd go to the mall and uh, walk around and oh, look at this, look at that, and just try to entertain ourselves, bump into people we knew sometimes. There used to be a machine that for two bucks, I think, you could put two bucks in the machine and my daughter could turn a dial and pick, I don't know, one of like eight or 10 different helium balloons. And it was actually a pretty cool machine. You press a button, you turn a dial. My daughter could do this at three or four years old. Press the button and watch the balloon blow up and it would tie a piece of ribbon on it. And when it was done, it would beep. You'd pull open the thing. Your kid could reach in and take out the balloon and you'd have a balloon in your hand and we'd walk around. Now, first time, maybe the first couple times I did this, I was stupid because I was a new father and I wasn't paying enough attention. And we'd be walking through the mall. She'd be holding the balloon and holding my hand and we'd be walking and we'd get to Friendly's. Friendly's used to be in the mall too. And she'd be like, dad, ice cream. And she'd open her hand and then she'd look up and the balloon would be on the ceiling and the ceilings in the Oakdale Mall are like 25 feet high. And then she'd cry. I'm like, don't worry, Sophie, we'll get a new balloon, all right? Let's have ice cream. No, I don't want a balloon now. So after a couple of times of losing these balloons, I realized you have to tie the balloon on the kid's hand. So I tie the balloon on my daughter's hand. We'd have ice cream. Sooner or later, we get cranky and tired. It'd be time to go home. And I'd have to get her out in the car. And sometimes it was the winter. That's why I drew this picture. There's my daughter, Sophia, in the winter. We'd go outside. And it was really, really cold. It was the winter time. And the helium gas would get really, really cold. And the balloon would start to deflate a little, get a little less firm. And it would be, because it was smaller, it, it changed the density. And the balloon would kind of, she'd be pulling it in the parking lot. And it was made of mylar. It was plastic. It wasn't going to rip or anything. But the balloon would kind of die. And she'd be crying like, Daddy, 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 my balloon is dead. And I'm like, Sophie, don't worry. One day I'm going to grow up and I'm going to be a chemistry teacher. And I'll better be able to explain this to you. But let's just get home. It's going to be okay. Daddy, Daddy, my balloon is dead. We'd be driving home. My balloon is dead. What am I going to do? I'm like, don't worry. We get in the house. And after a couple of minutes, the house would be warmer. The helium would warm up. The balloon would expand. And it would kind of come back to life. Daddy, you are the smartest man in the world, she used to say. It used to make me feel so good. Now, there's a lot of chemistry going on in that little story. It's easy to understand. It's probably even happened to some of you. We're going to talk today about gas pressure or air pressure, and we're going to talk about uh, units of air pressure, and we're going to explain to you why that happens and, and why in the cold the balloon shrinks and, and gets small and collapses and why in the warm house it, it expands and makes your daughter happy again. It's important to have a happy daughter or a happy son. Although there's, sons take a lot more work, right? We all know that. Gas or air pressure? Air and gas pressure, right? Air is the air we breathe. Gas could be anything. You could have a balloon of helium. So it's the same idea. Gas is air. Pressure is caused by the collision of particles. The, the air particles, the molecules of air, the molecules of nitrogen and oxygen and carbon dioxide coming out of my mouth, any other gas that's in the room. In this room here, we got methane and helium and who knows what else. They're all banging around. 
all these particles. Now, the more collisions that you have in a second, the greater the pressure, right? When you take your balloon outside, the particles slow down. The temperature is lost to the atmosphere as the, as the, as the energy tries to equalize between its really excited inside the balloon and in the winter, the air outside is much less kinetic energy, it's much colder. The energy transfers out of the balloon, the particles slow down, there's less collisions and they're weaker, right? But when you bring it back in the house, the heat from the house tries to equalize the temperature inside the balloon, the balloon molecules and the helium, they get faster and faster and they start banging around harder and harder and there's more collisions and that makes the pressure go up. So with less collisions and weaker collisions, that gives you lower pressure. And when you bring it in the house, right? You bring in the balloon in the warm house, it recharges, what happens, right? If you bring the balloon in the house, the helium gets more kinetic energy from the air in the house. The heat energy is transferred into the balloon. There's more frequent and stronger collisions and that makes the balloon expand, which makes the balloon float. That makes kids smile. It's all chemistry. You know how you make a kid smile? Chemistry. Anybody not smiling now is not listening, right? Because I'm talking chemistry and chemistry is going to make you smile. Now, we measure it in four units. Okay, look at this. And most of the units are weirdo, right? They're a weirdo. You do a lot of stuff in chemistry. You know, it's just metrics and mathematics and we have to write them all on table A. We're going to see that in a second. Normal pressure or standard pressure is called one atmosphere. The simplest unit is called an atmosphere. Basically, the whole atmosphere is pressing down on your head, right? It's pressing down on your skin. It's pressing down on everything. One atmosphere. And we shorten that to one ATM. Now, the units we're going to use a lot in mathematics and chemistry are weird. The units are called kilopascals. That means thousand pascals. Pascals are little. Kilopascals are a thousand times bigger. Like a meter is one step and a kilometer is a thousand of them. Kilo is a thousand times a pascal, so kilopascal. Now, as it turns out, 101.3 kilopascals is what's called normal pressure. One atmosphere is the same as 101.3, and we abbreviate that KPA. It's a little k, capital P, little a, KPA, kilopascals. Now, in the United States, for a lot of reasons, because we're both advanced and and, and dopey, we still use the English system. We use pounds per square inch. Now, the same amount of pressure, normal pressure, would be measured at 14.7 PSI, pounds per square inch. My bicycle tires, when I'm outside, I pump up my bike tires on my bike before every ride, between 90 and 95 PSI. That's pretty high pressure, right? 14.7 is normal, but to make those little skinny tires really, really hard so that there's when I sit on the bike, the, the, the tires don't kind of squash, there's less friction, there's less touching, makes the wheels go faster. I press it up to 90 or 95 pounds per square inch. So that's pretty high pressure. Now, pressure was originally uh, created as a, as a measurement by an Italian man who invented what's called the barometer. I think we're gonna talk about him, Mr. Torricelli. Um, they used mercury, right, and a metric ruler because that's what they had back then. And when he figured out how to do this, he figured out, I'll show you how this works. Oh, this is his name, Evangelista at the bottom. He could have went into the pizza business with a name like that, right? Hey, and Evangelista Torricelli makes the best pizza. He also makes the best barometers. Um, as it turns out, they measured the, the air pressure by getting a big bucket of mercury. I'll show you how that works. And, and a ruler and measure how much the mercury goes up a tube. And it was determined that normal, is when the mercury gets pushed up the tube 760 millimeters, right? So the unit of what is the pressure, 760 millimeters of mercury, that when the mercury gets pushed that far up the tube, that means the air is pressing normal. If the mercury goes higher, that means the air pressure is higher. And if the mercury doesn't go up quite that high, that means like on a hot day, the pressure is usually lower because the air rises and it's not pressing so hard. So there's, all these different units. Now we're gonna write um, in a minute on the reference table, but let me show you how a barometer works. This is how it actually works. First of all, picture on the left, 
That's the whole atmosphere. One atmosphere, all of the air basically is pressing down on you, banging around, crashing into you all the time. You don't really feel it. I don't notice it. There's none on me, but it's pressing on every, even my eyeballs, pressing on everything, right? Because you were born this way. It's like a fish, doesn't know they're wet. They don't know they're wet till you get them in a, with a hook and you take them out of the water. Like, oh my gosh, where's the water? That's how you feel with the air pressure. You don't even realize it. You think we're in nothing, but we're not in nothing. We're actually in, in, in the air and the air is banging on us. The molecules are crashing into us to the point where we're getting pressed in every direction, 14.7 pounds per square inch. Now this picture here in the top right, this is how the original barometer worked. These guys were like, hey, let's take a road trip We'll get some mercury because it's a fun element. We'll get a big bucket, a bunch of glass tubes, we'll get some wine, and we'll go from town to town and we'll set this up and we'll measure how high does the mercury go up and we'll, we'll figure out what normal air pressure is and we'll have a good time. So this is what you do. Get a big bucket of mercury. And then you get a long tube that's closed at the top. Suck all the air out of it and you put the tube inside the mercury. Now, the air pressure's banging on everything, including the mercury, and that's gonna push the mercury up the tube. Now, if the air is banging at a certain level, it's gonna push the mercury up at a certain level. And then you get a ruler and you measure how many millimeters high is the mercury column. Now they measured it in the mountains, they measured it in the valleys, they measured it on the ocean, they measured it on a cold day, on a hot day, on a medium day. And, and these guys, Evangelista Torricelli and his friends, they measured it hundreds of times. They took a road trip and they said, we're gonna just measure the air pressure with my new machine called the barometer and then they voted, what's normal? They actually had to say, all right, what are we gonna decide is normal? When the air pushes the mercury this high, that's a normal. That's probably how they said it because they were from Italy. That's a normal. And they decided when the mercury gets pushed up this tube to 760 millimeters, that's normal or standard pressure. Now, since then we've got new machines like my bicycle pump has a little gauge on it that works in a totally different way but the air is pushing on something that measures the oomph or the push or the pressure. And that pressure is caused by the, the bombardment of the molecules banging into everything. And the stronger and the, the more frequent collisions of air particles or gas particles, that increases the pressure. And usually it stays pretty stable. I mean, the air pressure goes up and down all day, but not dramatically and not instantaneously. The air in this room is pretty constant. The temperature is pretty constant in this room. The air pressure is normal. I'm not gonna notice any change. It's not gonna hurt my ears. It's, I'm not gonna feel, I'm not gonna get squashed. I'm not gonna expand. Standard pressure. Now on this next slide in blue, right here, we have this table A, it's called standard uh, temperature and pressure. Now standard pressure, we already have 101.3 kPa, that's called kilopascal, and standard pressure is also one atmosphere. Now underneath it, I'm gonna do this. One ATM equals 101.3 kPa equals 760 millimeters of mercury equals 14.7 PSI. Now if you don't write like a maniac, it's gonna fit just like that. See that? That's what you should do. Hit pause, do that now. These numbers, the state only gives you the first two, kilopascals and atmospheres. I'm giving you the mercury and I'm giving you the, the American unit, PSI. We're gonna be able to convert backwards and forwards for all four of these different units. Now I know, because this is not my first rodeo, that you don't really understand these units of pressure, right? They're like weird units. What the heck is he really talking about? What's a pound per square inch? That means if you had one square inch, like the size of a postage stamp, one inch by one inch, it would push down 14.7 pounds on that spot. And right next to it, another 14.7 pounds. And that almost makes no sense because that means like there's 14.7 pounds pushing this way, but you know what? There's 14.7 pounds pushing this way and that keeps this side normal is 14.7 pushing up and 14.7 pushing down. It's, it's from every direction and you're used to it, so you don't feel it. Kilopascals, the freak does that mean? Nobody even knows, right? It's just a unit, 101.3, talk about an, a special measurement. 
these are just mathematical constructs for us, right? We don't have to understand them too deeply. These are just measurements of the air pressure. If we were to compare the pressure in this can compared to the pressure in, in the outside, is it higher or lower? And, and how much higher or lower? We're gonna use these units and we're gonna be able to convert back and forth because they're all equal to each other. We can make different conversion factors. So we can switch from atmospheres to kilopascals or kilopascals to millimeters or even pounds per square inch, right? I can pump up my tires to 94 PSI and I can figure out what is that in atmospheres or what is that in KPA. Write these down. Now, the next thing I wanna look at, we're gonna get back to the math tomorrow, I think. The math is not so exciting, it's easy. Phase diagram, right? We've been through the heating curve and the cooling curve and we're good at those. And there's some homework, you gotta draw some more of them. A phase diagram will show what phase a substance is at almost any temperature and any pressure. Now this basically is the simplified, all phase diagrams look like this. Now, they come in different shapes. Sometimes the straight line, that line by number one there, sometimes it's a little this way, sometimes it's this way, sometimes it's got a bit of a curve. The curvish line that goes from four to two to three all the way to the edge there, you know, that moves to the right, that moves to the left, it, it's a little bit different angles. They're all similar, but they're all different. I mean, every substance is gonna be different phase at different temperatures and pressures. They're all a little different. This is a kind of a, a standardized version. The dotted line going across, that's gonna be called normal pressure, right? Pressure is on the up and down y-axis and across the bottom, we're gonna have temperature. Now we're gonna make this one for water because you know about water, you know all about water. You know the boiling point, you know the freezing point, you know when it's a solid or liquid or gas, it makes sense. But all substances, we can make one for gold. It's not gonna be as exciting because gold is mostly a solid. By the time it gets to be a liquid, it's so hot, you're not really sure what that means. It's so freaking hot. And to be a gas, gold to be a gas, it's possible too hot. This is gonna be the phase diagram for water. So let's go through what are these, these points, what do these curves mean? We'll fill in some stuff. On the y-axis, standard pressure in kilopascals is 101.3. We could write one atmosphere, fine. We could write 760 millimeters of mercury or 14.7 PSI. Kilopascals is a nice metric unit, even though you're not used to it, it's a good one. On the bottom, we're gonna use centigrade. We could use Kelvin, we could even use the F scale, but we don't like to say the F word in chem, right? Fahrenheit, it's like a curse. We use zero centigrade and uh, 100 centigrade, because you know those are freezing point and boiling point for water. Now, point number one, see it's a label. What the heck is point one called? Let's think about this. At point one, it's standard pressure, normal. All right, so it's normal pressure. And it's at zero degrees centigrade. What happens to water at zero degrees centigrade? And what about point two? Point two is also at normal pressure and it's at 100 degrees centigrade. Something happens to water at 100 degrees centigrade. What happens? Let's see. 44, point number one is called the normal freezing point. It could be called the normal melting point, right? Normal freezing or normal melting point. Because at normal pressure, standard pressure, that's where water changes from solid to liquid or liquid to solid, depends on which way you're going. So point one is called the normal freezing point or the normal melting point. Point two, at 100 degrees, that's called the normal boiling point. The normal boiling point or the normal condensation point. So point one and two, of course, are on normal pressure or standard pressure. They're called normal, normal temperatures for freezing, normal temperatures for boiling. Now we have two other points. We have point three and point four. Those are really weird. Now, before we go forward, I'm gonna draw on this graph for a second. And uh, let's see if I can draw. Since this is the, right here at zero degrees, this is the freezing point. At normal pressure, if we're below zero, if we're below zero, that means this is gonna be the solid phase. If you are on this graph at any pressure and any temperature, and you find yourself in that 
left little section of the graph. That means if you're water, you're gonna be in the solid phase. Now, if you happen to be at this temperature or this temperature or even room temperature, and your water, if you're below the boiling point and above the melting point in this section, you're gonna be in the liquid phase. Everything in this section is the liquid phase. Now, what about right here? Now, point two, the normal boiling point. So if you're past two, if you're over here or over here or over here, you are actually now in the gas phase. Now, the solid phase is everything over here. This is all solid. Low pressure, high pressure, anywhere in here is gonna be solid. And if we go to liquid, I'll use blue, the liquid section, this is all liquid. No matter where you are in here, anywhere in here, this is all liquid. And everything here on the right, in front of the curve, is the gas phase. So the phase diagram, let me clear all these drawings since it's messy now. The phase diagram, if you know your temperature and pressure, if you could put your pencil on a point on this graph and you understand it a little, you could know, is this substance a solid, a liquid, or a gas? And you know that because you know what the point one and point two are, right? And standard pressure. You're either below the freezing point or you're above the melting point, you're above the boiling point, or you're below the boiling point, you're in the condensation point. You can figure out, are you solid, liquid, or gas? Now, the pressure changes, and I know you don't understand pressure too much yet, but normal pressure is normal. We're in the, you're in normal pressure in Somai right now. If it was high pressure for Vestal, instead of being 101.3, it might be 115. That's pretty high pressure for around here. Low pressure might be 95 or 96 kPa. Doesn't get too crazy around here. The pressure stays in a normal zone. But you might, you know, you can have a higher pressure, right? Inside of a, a, a steel container, you could put gas in a container or on the top of Mount Everest, when you have less of the atmosphere pressing on you, you can have a lower pressure. So substances are gonna act differently. They're gonna be different phases, depends on the temperature and the pressure. Now, point three and four, let's get rid of this drawing business. Point three and four, what the heck's going on here? Now, point three is a weird point. And, and for water, it's possible to do this. It's above freezing, right? It's, I don't know, I forget, it's like two degrees centigrade. I, it's coming up. It's a low temperature and the pressure is not zero, and I can make that pressure, and I have a, a bell jar that sucks the air out of this glass contraption. I can make that pressure in the classroom. Hard to hold it at exactly there. But at that particular point, the low, low pressure and pretty chilly, it's called the triple point. Because at that point, that one point, you get solids, liquids, and gases all at the same time. And all six phase changes are going to occur. The solid will become a liquid. The liquid will become a solid. The liquid will become a gas. The gas would become a liquid. And the solid would become a gas, and the gas would deposit into a solid. At point three, it's called the triple point, because all three phases can exist at the same time. And all six phase changes occur at the same time. And they all keep occurring in what's called the dynamic equilibrium. It keeps changing and keeps changing and keeps staying the same. Point four is kind of a weird point. Um, it's actually very much at a scale. It's a super high pressure, but at some point of really high pressure, and not too, I think it's 300 cents really at a scale, but it's like 300 something centigrade and some crazy pressure. You can no longer tell the difference between gas and liquid. The, it, the particles are moving so fast, they're under so much pressure. In a sense, you can't really make sense of, is this a liquid or a gas anymore? It's just, it's called the critical point, which the point where you can't tell, you can't critically determine, is it this or is it that? It's kind of like both at the same time. So normal freezing point. Water will normally freeze and melt at zero degrees centigrade and normal pressure. It's, you know, normal. The normal boiling point, 
is also the normal condensing point. Water boils at normal, normal pressure, boils at 100 degrees. If it's a different pressure, it gets a different, a different temperature, right? You can boil at higher or lower temperatures as well. Now, the triple point, this is the weird thing. Look at this temperature, 273 Kelvin. That's just above freezing, just above the freezing point of water. And 4.58 kPa, that's low. That's under 5 kPa. 101.3 is normal. We're down to like four and a half here. But this is not like an extraordinary thing. This, this doesn't happen naturally on Earth. You gotta have a little more air pressure than that in the air. But in a, in a chem lab, in a physics lab in college, you can do this. Not in, not in high school, but in college you could. <clears throat> Critical point, this point is a little out of scale on the graph, but at 374 Kelvin, which is pretty high, right? Water boils at 373. But look at that pressure, 22,000 kPa, that's crazy. Right at that point, things kind of fall apart. Is is it a liquid or a gas? But it's both, and and it's more of a vocabulary word for us. Don't worry about it. It's not a big deal. Now let's take out table H. H is for happy. I'm happy. You're happy. We'll all be happy. Table H. The title for this table: Vapor pressure of four liquids. Now I know you don't know what vapor pressure is. I told you what it is. We'll talk about it again soon. The vapor pressure for four liquids. And what are those liquids? They're listed right on the table. The first one is not propane. Look at that again and pay attention. Propanone, propanone. Propane is a gas, propanone is a liquid. It's, it's a ketone, it's not a hydrocarbon. Propane is a hydrocarbon. It's kind of like butane and methane and octane. Propanone, ethanol happens to be the alcohol that's in wine and beer wine and beer and even things like, I guess, whiskey, they're all percentages, not 100% ethanol. You can't drink ethanol 100%. It's way too toxic. Um, but it's a liquid and uh, it has vapor pressure. Water, you're very familiar with. And now ethanoic acid, number 52, it'll tell you. Ethanoic acid sounds really cool. It's an organic chemistry name. You could call that stuff acetic acid if you felt like it, right? But another name for that is just vinegar. Now the vinegar you buy at home is like 5% vinegar. It's a solution also, but you're gonna have pure ethanoic acid, pure acetic acid, it's the same thing. Super strong vinegar. But if you smelled ethanoic acid, it smells like, it smells like strong vinegar. Okay, 53, ethanol is the alcohol, it's in wine and beer and things like that. Propanone's a ketone, similar to acetone. Acetone's a nail polish remover. I hate that smell. Um, water is water. The y-axis, kilopascals for pressure. Look, we got the dotted line. Hey, that's the same dotted line that goes, yeah, remember we just looked at the phase diagram? Same dotted, oh, look at this curve. See that big curve for water? Same curve on the, on the phase diagram. It's all coming together. Now this is four curves at once. That'll make you crazy. Only look at one at a time. The X scale, temperature. Now this is also another thing. The KPAs go up by 10. The, the temperature degrees go up by five. The boxes, they're very orderly, but they're not equal. You gotta pay attention. The state does this for no, you know why they do this? So you mix it up. It's not 10, 20, 30, 40, but on the bottom it's 5, 10, 15, 20. They're trying to confuse you. It's very obvious, but don't get fooled, right? And only look at one curve at a time. You can't look at water and ethanol at the same time. One curve at a time. They put four, look, see how big this page is? And they leave all this space for our mole islands and stuff. No, they should have four graphs. So you look at one graph at a time. You know what they do all four at once? Because they needed this space? No, because they want to confuse you. Look, you're not going to pay attention. You just, oh, that, that curve is a good enough curve. No, there's four different curves. Only look at one at a time. Yeah, here comes the story. Let me tell you a story. 1972, I was 12 years old. I was a Boy Scout and we used to go camping. And one of the things about being in the Boy Scouts, at least in our troop, I mean, it wasn't very organized. It wasn't, wasn't like up here. I've been to a lot of Eagle Scout uh, ceremonies here. We didn't have any Eagle Scouts in my troop number nine in Queens, but we used to go camp. It was more like a camping club and we were Boy Scouts because we needed to be able to get into the camps. It was good, but it really wasn't the Boy Scouts so much. But anyway, there was a kid, his name is Thomas Buckholz. 
Long live Thomas Buckholz. I, I still tell his story about this poor kid. I hope he's grown up to be a happy guy. I've done some stupid things in my life, but here's the stupid Thomas Buckholz story. Not stupid Thomas, but stupid story Thomas Buckholz did. He was just a kid. The rule was you had to cook your own food, and no matter what you did to it, you had to eat it. So you had to pay attention. If you burnt it, you had to eat it. So kids, we bring all kinds of things, hot dogs and buns. You know, you put them on a stick, you put them in the fire, you cook your food, you eat them, you know, try not to burn them too much. But, you know, sometimes the food was a little burnt and you ate it. And you had to like, ah, oh, I better pay more attention next time. It's a good lesson in that. Well, Mrs. Buckholz, Thomas's mother, thought, hey, my son, he likes hot dogs. He's going to have some pork and beans. So she sends him a can of pork and beans. They same cans of pork and beans you have now. They used to have them back in 1972 when we were boys. The pork and beans is a sealed system. The can is sealed. Makes perfect sense now. But Thomas figured, I got to heat them up. They taste better when they're hot. So instead of opening up the top of the can and lifting the flap a little and putting it in the fire, in the coals there on the side of the fire to warm it up. His knucklehead just puts the can in the fire. Now there's like five or six kids around this fire. We all got our hot dogs and our frying pans with, with uh, hamburgers in it or whatever. We're all boiling water to put corn on a cob in it. Well, who the heck knows what we're trying to cook? But Thomas Buckholz puts a whole sealed can of Campbell's pork and beans in the fire. I can still see the red label in my head. And you know, we're all cooking, we're all dumb kids. And all of a sudden, boom, the damn pork and beans explodes because he put the sealed can next to the fire coals that got so hot inside. And we all get covered in beans and Thomas Buckles took a good beating for that because we were all annoyed with him for being so dumb. Now, we didn't really hurt him. You should never hurt people, especially for making dumb mistakes. And I make dumb mistakes all the time, but Thomas Buckholz made a dopey mistake, right? He tried to cook his, even if it didn't explode, how was he supposed to open it? The can was going to be so hot. What a dumb thing. But anyway, he was a kid. And the can exploded. And probably that's why I'm a chemistry teacher. I'm like, hey, why did that happen? Let me think about it. Oh, yeah. Vapor pressure. I didn't think about vapor pressure for sure, but you know what I mean. The can in a bottle. Here's another picture of a, of a sealed bottle. They're both examples of what we call closed systems. If you heat them up, it could cause an explosion. And the reason they explode, the reason the can exploded, the reason this bottle would explode, the top would blow off probably because it's plastic. But if it was really sealed, the glass might break if you heated it up enough. But the reason it explodes is because increase in vapor pressure. And I'm going to talk about this. The increase in pressure because the heat is going to make the water in the can. Now, in the can of pork and beans, there's water in there. There's tomato sauce kind of, but that's got water in it. There's water in a bottle. The hotter the water, the more it's going to evaporate. You make it hot enough, it's even going to boil. And the liquid's going to turn into a gas. And the gas particles have a lot more energy. And they're moving around really, really, really fast. There's a lot more banging and banging and banging. And the pressure increases. And the pressure goes up and the pressure goes up until something's got to give. And the can will explode on the seam, or the bottle might, well, the cap would probably shoot off first here, hopefully. Uh, otherwise, it'd be very dangerous because the glass would explode and break out, and then the hot water would get on you too. Be a doubly bad thing. But increasing the pressure will cause it to explode. And the reason the pressure increases in that space above the water, as the water evaporates faster and faster and even boils and jumps into the gas phase, there's less and less room for all those molecules. There's so many more collisions. There's so many more powerful collisions because of the heat. Something's got to give. All right. Table H. What is the vapor pressure for water at 25 degrees? Now, in the top of this bottle at room temperature, we got water. It's a sealed system. Now, outside, there's air pressure. And inside, there's air pressure. Same thing. It's the air, right? Put the cap on. There's air in there. You're not pumping it up. It's just air pressure in there. The vapor pressure is the extra pressure caused by the evaporating water. Now, if the water is at 25 degrees, room temperature, room's 25 degrees, the water is not going to evaporate much, but it's going to evaporate. And once it evaporates, it's got nowhere to go. It's going to get stuck in that little gap at the top with the air. Now, the air in there already has pressure because the air molecules are banging around at a certain rate. 
we'll call it 101.3 kPa, normal. We'll just say, ah, it's normal in there. But with the extra water evaporating, there's going to be more molecules of water in that space than before. There's going to be more collisions. There's going to be more pressure. How much more? And that pressure is called vapor pressure. Table H will tell us. We go out to 25 degrees and we slide up to the water curve. Now the water curve is pretty low, but it looks to be about seven kPa, right? Or maybe four. Ah, let's see. Yeah, maybe four. So in that little gap above the water bottle, the pressure is greater in there than outside in the air. Because in that sealed system, not only is there air pressure, there's extra pressure caused by the evaporating liquid. Now that water doesn't want to evaporate too well. It's water, water sticks together. It's got a lot of attraction to itself. It doesn't evaporate well. It has what's called low vapor pressure. It doesn't evaporate well. Now, what if we raise it up to 70 degrees? What if we heat this bottle up to 70? Now, 70 centigrade, not 70 Fahrenheit. 70 centigrade is pretty dang hot. I mean, it would begin to cook you if you were in a pot with water that big, that temperature. We go out to 70 and we go up to water and that seems to be at 30 kPa, 30 kPa. So that means it used to be 101.3. Now it's up to at least 131.3 kPa. Now, if the bottle is pressure rated, and, and companies that make glass bottles, soda, and things like that, they have to know how, how strong is their bottle, because if they're going to drive that bottle in a truck through, I don't know, Texas in the summer, they can get pretty hot in there. The pressure can build up. The whole truck will explode. Right? you got to make sure the bottles are going to take it, or else you got to refrigerate the truck. You can't just drive bottles of soda through the hot desert sun if the bottles are not strong enough. Now, what if we heated it up to 90 degrees? And that's pretty damn hot for, for soda. But at 90 degrees, if we slide our hand all the way up here, water is going to be at about 70 kPa. The vapor pressure is going to be 70. Now, there's already air pressure of 101.3. If it goes up 70 more, those bottles could explode. So what is vapor pressure? Vapor pressure is that extra pressure that you get in a closed system, like a bottle or a can that's sealed, or in a tank, like an air tank that you put a scuba tank on your back. There's only, uh, if it's filled with water, a steel can filled with water or steel, any liquid, that extra evaporation that fills up that space with the air, that extra pressure above air pressure is called vapor pressure. Now, let's imagine we have three corked bottles with equal amounts of liquid. We have a bottle of ethanol, a bottle of ethanoic acid, and a bottle of propanol. We're going to work straight across. Now, what if we have the number 65? What if they're all at 25 degrees centigrade? If we do them in the classroom and we fill them up, same 50 mLs of each, say, and then we put the cork in, inside in the air above the liquid, it's normal pressure, there's air in there, 101.3. But in 15 minutes after they've been corked, there's been a certain amount of evaporation. Now, each liquid has a certain amount of attraction to itself. Some liquids don't have a lot of attraction, they evaporate well. Some liquids have more attraction and they evaporate slower. But when you heat them, even to room temperature, that's going to encourage evaporation. So at 25 degrees, what is the vapor pressure of ethanol? So you got to go out to 25 degrees on here and go up to the ethanol line, and that looks to be about 7 kPa, 8 I wrote here. Ethanoic acid at 25 degrees is really low, but propanone, look at propanone. Propanone's that first curve on the left at 25 degrees, Propanone's at 31 kPa. So you have three bottles of liquids. They're all clear, but they're all different liquids. And at the same temperature, they're going to create different amounts of pressure, different amounts of vapor pressure, because they evaporate at different rates. Now, once it evaporates, it's going to be bouncing around. Some of it's going to condense, but it's going to, it's going to keep evaporating 
and it's going to keep condensing. It's going to get to be stable. We call that a dynamic equilibrium where we have constant evaporation, but we have equal constant uh, condensation. But ethanol is going to have just 8 kPa. Ethanoic acid is going to be hardly noticeable at all. Ethanoic acid does not evaporate very well. It's very sticky, very attracted to itself. Propanone jumps right into the gas phase, has almost no attraction, relatively speaking. What if we heat these up to 45 degrees? We've got to find 45 degrees, and we've got to go up, and we've got to write those numbers down. So I'll give you a second. We're almost done. This is the last number, 68. We're going to be done. Now, at 45 degrees, ethanol produces 22 kPa. So in order to get to 45 degrees, you have to put all of these on a hot plate and turn it to 45 centigrade. This is warm. You wouldn't, you know, it's like a really hot day. And that means that at this hotter temperature, ethanol is going to evaporate more. There's going to be more ethanol gas in that space. It's going to be higher pressure. Ethanol gas is going to go all the way up to 6 kPa. Because ethanol gas, it doesn't like to evaporate. It has a low vapor pressure. Really sticky. Look what the heck's going on with propanone. It's up to 70 kPa extra, 70 extra kPa. That's, that's like one point, one, one and three quarters normal pressure. That's, that's pretty high pressure. It's starting to get scary. Look at the question at the bottom for 68. Which bottle is going to be first? Burst, which bottle is going to burst first? That's hard to say. Which one's going to blow up like a bomb first? If you heat them all up together, we're going to find out. What if we heat them all up to 75? I turn the three dials on the three hot plates, make them all 75 centigrade, which is pretty damn hot. It's cooking temperature, right? Not quite boiling, but it's, you're not going to be comfortable. At 75 degrees, right, you go up. And ethanol, which is the third line. Well, I can't see it sideways, but ethanol is going to go all the way up to 88 kPa. That's pretty high. That's on top of the normal pressure. There's 101.3 plus 88. Ethanoic acid, though, is only up to 23. Ethanoic acid does not evaporate very well. But look what happens to the propanone. Off the chart. That's almost double air pressure alone. Which one do you think is going to blow up first? It's going to be the propanone. Three volumes of the same amount of liquid, of different liquids, ethanol, ethanoic acid, propanone, three corks, but as you heat them up, they're going to have different vapor pressure. Vapor pressure is the extra pressure in a sealed system caused by the evaporation of a liquid. Some liquids evaporate easily. Some liquids don't evaporate so easily. That's based on their molecular structure and their attraction together. Out of these three liquids here, the one with the lowest vapor pressure, the ethanoic acid, has the strongest attraction. It doesn't evaporate well. Propanone has the highest vapor pressure. That means it's not attracted too well. It jumps right into the gas phase, and the hotter it is, the quicker it jumps. So which would burst first? Propanone, of course. This was a little longer, but it's okay. I love chemistry. Phases is cool, right? Read the basics. That's what you got to do. All right, we're done with this. Come watch the other one. I'm going to make the other one in a little while. Bye.